Hi everyone, this is the lecture for chapters 15, 6, 8, and 9. You're probably wondering why we're starting with chapter 15. Well, it's about informative speaking and your next speech will be an informative speech. So before we get into exactly how to put a speech together, let's look at what it means to inform our audience about a topic and the kinds of topics that lend themselves to informative speaking. Just to be clear, in your speech, you'll be informing us about a topic that's related to your field of study. So that should help you narrow it down. It should also excite you because you'll get to share something you already know something about with the class. If you haven't chosen a field of study yet, you can do a topic related to a class you've taken that you're interested in. Regardless, you'll still have to let me know what your topic is, and you'll learn how to organize and present the information in a way that will be valuable to your audience. The whole point of informative speaking is to provide information to the audience that they don't already have. Unlike persuasive speeches, you're not trying to get them to make any significant changes in their values, beliefs, or behaviors. Now, they might be inspired to think or do something based on your speech, but that's not your main purpose here. You're just trying to teach them something new in an understandable and interesting way. You should take advantage of the knowledge and strengths that you already possess and back that up with good research and source citations. Most informative speeches will fit into one of five categories. Speeches about events, speeches about people, speeches about objects, speeches about processes, and speeches about concepts. Let's look at examples of the different kinds of speeches within those categories that might give you some ideas about what informative speeches look like. First, speeches about events. An event is something that's happened, might happen, could happen, or will happen. Generally speaking, events happen in a particular order. So when you're explaining them to an audience, the best way to do it tends to be in chronological order. That's not the only way to organize a speech about an event, but it's the most common. Here are two examples of this kind of speech. The first one is about how women gained the right to vote in the United States. It's definitely organized in chronological order, as you can see by the main points. The second one, although it's also about an event, is not organized in chronological order. It's about what caused the 2021 power outages in Texas. So it's actually organized in causal order. The first main point is about the effect, and the other two main points are about what caused it. Next is speeches about people. You can certainly choose your informative speech about a person who's somehow connected to your field of study, either a type of person or a specific well-known person. Find a connection between that person and the audience and determine what the audience could learn from that person. Here's an example about the transgender actress Laverne Cox. This is organized chronologically, although sometimes these speeches are organized categorically. Then we have speeches about objects. Objects are things that exist, that have form. If it exists, we can talk about it, no matter how tiny or huge. So a quirk or the universe or anything in between, we can give a speech about it. We need to be able to describe it in a way that the audience can understand and relate to it. A lot of speeches about objects are organized spatially or categorically. Here are some examples. This first one is about the human heart, and it's organized spatially according to the different parts and where they're located and how they're connected. The other one is about a particular type of hearing aid, and it's organized categorically. Speeches about processes have to do with how things work or how they're put together. Many of them are presented in a step-by-step -step process and are organized chronologically, like these. The first one is about school loan forgiveness and takes you through the steps of doing that. And the other one is about making a workbench and also takes you through steps. And finally, speech is about concepts, which are abstract ideas that could be theories, values, attitudes, or anything that doesn't fall into the other categories. They tend to be a little more complex than the other types of informative speeches. So it's important that you help the audience clearly visualize your ideas, like this first one, 
Cryptocurrencies are difficult for a lot of people to understand, so your speech would need to clarify what they are to your audience. This one is organized categorically. The other one explains the concept of privacy and it's organized chronologically. Hopefully I've given you a little heads up about the kinds of topics and speech organization patterns that are common to informative speeches. There are some handouts under the video on this page that can help you put together your informative speech. Let's move on to Chapter 6, Topic and Purpose. The things we'll be talking about in the next few chapters about putting together your speech apply to both informative and persuasive speeches, but I'll try to let you know when you need to do something different for each different type of speech. The general organization and outlining rules are basically the same, though. We all want our speech to have an impact, whether that is to help people understand a topic, take an action, or even to celebrate an event. Your purpose is the impact you want your presentation to have on your audience. It's why you're there, why the audience is there, and what you want them to know, think, or do about your topic. Your purpose is your opportunity to make a difference, and it'll guide you as you prepare the rest of your speech. So, about your topic. What are you going to talk about? That's the first thing you need to know. If we haven't already gone over the assignment prompt in class, you might want to look at it so you know the requirements. Some instructors totally leave it up to the student to come up with topics with no guidance. Others tell them exactly what to talk about or give them a list of topics to pick from. I hope I give some guidance, but leave it open enough so that students have some leeway to choose something that fits both the requirements and their own interests. Often, brainstorming is a good way to pick a topic, where you just write down whatever topics come to your mind. Brainstorming can be a fun and inventive way to discover unique topics and approaches for your presentations. Try brainstorming with people who know you or your speaking situation, such as friends or classmates. Sometimes just chatting with another person can help you generate new ideas. Don't be afraid to ask around, or you can ask me if you just can't decide. Once you know your topic, you need to determine your purpose. There are three types of general purposes, informative, persuasive, and connecting. We've already talked about informative, which is to teach or educate your audience about a topic, and then persuasive, which is to convince or change an audience's existing values, attitudes, or behaviors. Connecting speeches have to do with special occasions, like funerals, weddings, or award ceremonies, where your general purpose is to connect the audience members with each other and with the occasion. We don't do those speeches in this class, but the techniques you learn here will definitely help you should you ever find yourself in a situation where you need to. From your general purpose, you can determine your specific purpose. A specific purpose is a detailed goal including the general purpose, public, topic, and outcome of your presentation. Having a detailed picture of your goal makes it much easier to plan your speech. Here's an example. If your topic is how to create a podcast, then your specific purpose could be to inform my audience of the different steps involved in creating and publishing a podcast. So you've got your general purpose, to inform. You've got the public, my audience. And then you've got the topic and the outcome, the different steps involved in creating and publishing a podcast. Now that you have a specific purpose, you'll need a thesis statement. A thesis statement is a complete, concise, and clear sentence summarizing the main idea of your presentation. The goal of your thesis statement is to pique your audience's interest and help them remember the key takeaway from your presentation. If it's an informative presentation, you need to state the knowledge the audience will gain and the importance of that information. If it's a persuasive presentation, you need to state the change in attitude, value, or behavior that you recommend and the reason for that change. If it's a connecting presentation, you need to state the occasion that brings the group together as a public and the values represented by that occasion. 
Your thesis statements need to be concise. That means it needs to be brief enough to understand and remember. You need to summarize your main idea in a single sentence, ideally fewer than 25 words. Long, complex thesis statements are difficult to grasp and easy to forget. Rambling sentences and paragraphs do not qualify as thesis statements. Here's a good example for a topic, specific purpose, and thesis statement for an informative speech. This is a process speech organized in chronological order. The topic is podcasting. The specific purpose, to inform my audience of the different steps involved in creating and publishing a podcast. The thesis statement, in order to become a podcaster, you have to determine the topic and format of your podcast, purchase the correct equipment, create and record your episodes, and publish the episodes through a hosting service. So, in this chapter, you've learned about topics, specific purposes, and thesis statements. Once you do that, that will give you a roadmap for preparing the rest of your presentation. Try the Finding Your Topic Exercise, Purpose Statement Worksheet, and the Thesis Statement Checklist. They'll help you get ready for the next steps. Let's move on to Chapter 8, Research and Citation. I know you probably know a lot about your topic, at least for the informative speech, because it's connected to your career somehow. But even if you do know a lot about it, you don't know everything, and you need to acknowledge the limits of your own standpoint and the value of other people's knowledge and experience. That's where research comes in. Research is the systematic collection and analysis of information. To collect information, Start early, have a plan, take notes, track sources, stay open. You can't just assume you're going to figure it out. You need to do all of those things. Note-taking could involve writing things down in a notebook or keeping a Word document open on your computer and copy-pasting the source citation and whatever text you might want to use from an article into that document or printing articles out, whatever works for you. Just make sure that you're keeping track of where all this information comes from so you can cite it correctly, both in your bibliography and verbally during your speech presentation. If we haven't already, we will shortly do a library research workshop with one of our librarians who will show us all the helpful resources you'll need to be able to access for your speeches. So I won't go over all of them here. Just know that our librarians are always available to help you, so don't be afraid to ask. While library resources are always the best places to find academic and professional sources of information, of course you can always find a wide range of information on the web, although you need to be more careful to avoid information that may not be of the best quality or made by people with no expertise, experience, or knowledge of your topic, just an opinion about it. Also, you may be unaware of filter bubbles. That's when a search engine like Google uses your past search history, browsing behavior, and social media activity to filter the information it provides to you. You can avoid this by using DuckDuckGo or Brave Search to do your searching. You'll get more and different hits and be aware of pseudo-academic sources. You may have used Google Scholar in the past. Unfortunately, it now contains many articles that are from predatory journals where anybody can pay to have their article published. So articles that have been rejected by legitimate journals often end up in these predatory journals. Stay away from Google Scholar. Use our library resources instead. You're paying for them anyway. Then you need to be aware of spoofed websites that look very much like the actual websites they're pretending to be. Usually the domain name is slightly misspelled. These sites tend to post disinformation or try to get your personal information to sell it. And of course, try to avoid anonymous sources if possible, since it's impossible to verify their credibility. Fake news has been a problem ever since there's been news. And I don't just mean labeling some news story fake because you don't like it. I mean stories that are actually made up 
fabricated or distorted. They've been around forever, but with the advent of the internet, they've really proliferated, and lots of people who might not otherwise have seen them have indeed seen and believed them because many people just tend to believe whatever they read and don't check them out, especially if it fits with what they already think is the case. Fortunately, reputable news sources have fact checkers and editors who review submissions before publication and are also willing to update and correct information that's proven to be wrong. But it's also on you to be vigilant in this area and do your best to stop fake news from spreading. The book recommends using the SIFT technique, which stands for Stop, Investigate the Source, find better coverage, and trace to original content. So, stop and consider the source. What do you know about the source? Do they use fact checkers? Do they have editorial oversight? If you don't know, move on to the next step. Investigate. Check for bias. I'll put some good sources to check for bias, like Ad Fontes or All Sides or Media Bias Fact Check at the bottom of the page under this video for you to use to see the kind of bias and if the source has failed fact checks. Find better coverage. Look for good solid sources and search the topic on them to see what their coverage of it is. Do they say the same thing? What's the real story? And finally, trace the original context. Try to find the original source of the information, the primary source, to see what originally happened. By the time you're done, man, you'll be very knowledgeable and can truly speak to the topic. A really great way to get information about a lot of the topics students choose to do in this class is to interview people. It's often overlooked as a source, mostly because students are a little hesitant to talk to someone else. They think that person won't want to talk to them or they'll be too busy and won't have time or the student is too shy to approach them. But really, it's a great way to find out about lots of topics. For instance, your informative speech is about some aspect of your career path, so maybe one of your instructors might be someone to talk to, or your boss if you're already working in your field, and your persuasive speech is going to be about some local issue that needs to be addressed, so whatever you choose to talk about, there's probably someone locally who could speak to that issue. Anyway, you certainly could find a person willing to take the time to answer some questions. Obviously, you'd need to actually have some questions that this person could answer, and you could use those answers in your speech to help explain and support your main points. The book gives some good ideas about how to choose the person, request the interview, set it up, take notes, so I won't go over those here. But just consider it as one of the potential ways to get information for your speeches. Plus, most people are generally happy to talk about themselves and what they do for a living. Okay, once you've got all your information, you're going to need to know how to document it correctly. Citing sources is incredibly important because it lets me and your audience know that you've done your research, and it's a major part of your credibility as a speaker. Failing to document correctly is plagiarism. Plagiarizing is the act of representing someone else's work as your own, either through direct copying or failing to provide a citation. This destroys your credibility and causes you to miss out on the enormous benefits of source citation. When you provide us with information but don't tell us where you got that information, we assume that was information you already knew before you created the speech. But if you got that information during your research and you failed to tell us where you got it, you've committed plagiarism. So there are a couple of things you have to do to avoid committing plagiarism. One is verbally citing your sources while you're actually speaking. So when you get to the part of the speech where you're providing some information you got from a source, you need to tell us. Give us enough information so that we have an understanding of where this piece of information came from. Just saying someone's name isn't enough if we don't know who that person is. Just saying the name of an article isn't enough if we don't know the journal or magazine that published it. The book gives some good examples of how to do this. But that's not enough. You also 
need to have formal citations. Now you don't show these formal citations to the audience, like don't put them at the end of a PowerPoint slideshow. However, they should be on the last page of your outline. Formal citations provide details that allow others, specifically me, to locate the sources that you write. Failing to include these citations in your written material, your outline, raises questions about your credibility as a speaker. Two of the most common formats for formal citations are produced by MLA, Modern Language Association, and the APA, American Psychological Association. Now, I don't care if you use MLA or APA as long as you're consistent. Hard to see here, but here are a couple of examples of the most common kinds of written bibliographical source citations. Uh, we also have examples in Canvas and on the library website, and these are from your book. There are lots of resources to go along with this chapter that you can use, and I'll post links to all of this underneath the video. And now let's move on to Chapter 9, Organization and Outlining. At this point in the speech-making process, you've decided on a topic, a specific purpose, and a thesis statement, and you've done some research and gotten some good sources. Now you're ready for the next step. You need to start putting everything together in an organized way so that it becomes a speech. Organizing and outlining effectively is the key to getting your point across and keeping your audience engaged. Okay, so you probably think you're going to start putting your speech together by starting to create the introduction, but that's not where we're going to start. Don't worry, we'll get there eventually, but before we do, we need to figure out what the main points and subpoints of the speech are going to be. Organizing your presentation begins with the information you've gathered to support your thesis, including your reasoning and your evidence. The main points are the key ideas that support your thesis statement, and the subpoints are the evidence and the reasoning that support those main points. So, gather all your research together and start looking at it and putting it into categories. Keeping your specific purpose and your thesis in mind, look at each piece of information. Does this example fit with this statistic? Does this expert testimony and this picture go together? Group similar things together. Don't forget where they came from so you can cite the source later. Then identify from that what your main points are. Sometimes they're obvious, but they might not be, so look for patterns. The groups will likely be your main points and the pieces of evidence are going to be your subpoints. If you're confused right now, don't worry, you'll figure it out. Okay, one thing you need to keep in mind is that when you group things together to create main points, you shouldn't have too many groups. In a speech, especially the kinds of speeches we do in this class, you don't want too many main points. People just can't follow that much information. Five is the most main points a speech should have, but frankly, three is the best number. It's the easiest for your audience to follow and remember. The book shows you why, but I don't have time to get into that. Just take my word for it. I've been doing this for a long time. At this point, you need to figure out the organizational pattern for your speech. We've briefly touched on most of the different patterns a couple of times before, but let's go over them all again. Most of them are going to use one of five general patterns, categorical, spatial, chronological, causal, and motivational. First is categorical. A categorical pattern organizes main points into generally recognized types, groups, or sets. Here's an example. To inform my audience about the different types of tomato plants that do well in Nevada's desert climate. That's the purpose. The thesis, understanding the three best types of tomatoes to grow in our Nevada desert, can make growing tomatoes fun and provide a bountiful harvest. So the main points, obviously, would be the different types of tomatoes. And so here they are. Main point one is early girl tomatoes. Main point two is celebrity tomatoes. And main point three 
is Roma tomatoes. A spatial pattern organizes main points according to location or position in space. Here's an example. The purpose is to inform my audience about the implications of an economic recession. The thesis is understanding what happens during an economic recession on a local, national, and global scale may help you be better prepared for a future one. The main points here are the local implications, the national implications, and global implications. A chronological pattern organizes main points into distinct moments in time. In this example, the purpose is to connect with friends and family members to mourn my uncle's passing and celebrate his life. The thesis, it's no surprise to see so many people here to honor Uncle Jesse, a deeply loyal man who always stood up for the people he loved. And the main points? Main point one, my uncle stood up for my mom when they were young. Two, my uncle stood up for me when I was a kid. And three, my uncle stood up for his mother before she died. A causal pattern organizes main points into causes and effects. The purpose of this one, to persuade my audience not to overfeed their dogs so the animals can live longer, healthier lives. The thesis, overfeeding your dog can cause serious health problems that reduce your pet's lifespan and quality of life. Main point one is the cause. Many pet owners overfeed their dogs thinking it's a harmless expression of love. Main point two is the effects but overfeeding your dog can cause heart disease, diabetes, and arthritis. And finally, motivational patterns. A motivational pattern organizes main points into problems and solutions. In this one, the purpose is to persuade my audience that companies should not base employee performance reviews on customer feedback. The thesis Companies should base performance reviews on feedback from fellow employees and managers because customer feedback is biased and unreliable. The main points, the first main point is the problems with customer feedback. And this one is broken down into some sub points here. A does not represent the average customer experience. B often displays race, gender, and age biases. Main point two, solutions for better performance reviews. A, peer evaluations. B, management observations. So, once you've figured out how the main points in your speech are going to be organized, then you need to figure out how you're going to move from one idea to the next one. You'll need what are called signposts. Just like signposts on the road, signposts in a speech tell the audience where they are now and where they're going next. The most important kinds of signposts are called transitions, and you use them between your main points when you finish one and are ready to move to the next one. If you don't use them, your speech will be very disjointed. You'll be talking about one thing and all of a sudden you're talking about something else. That can make it difficult for your audience to keep up. How do transitions work? The book gives a formula for creating effective transitions. Use this simple formula, closing anchor, where you restate the current point. You have a bridge where you signal a change in topic or focus, and then an opening anchor where you state your next point. Here's an example. So, as you can see, using customer feedback to determine how well an employee is doing can be very problematic. But what could be done instead? Well, I've got some ideas that involve in-house evaluations and observations. Let me share them with you. This speaker moves very nicely from the main point discussing the problems to the next part where they begin to talk about their solution to the issue. If they just stopped talking about the problem and started talking about the solution, people would have been confused. But they're not now because they know where the speaker is in his speech. And that's what you need to do every time you move from one main point to the next. Okay, now we're at the introduction part. Well, actually at the introduction and conclusion part. Hopefully you understand now that it's important to figure out what your main points are before you create your introduction, because it will make your introduction much more effective. 
The introduction will be the first words that come out of your mouth regarding the speech. So it's got some heavy lifting to do, and it's important to get it right. A good introduction does four critical things. It gets the audience's attention, it shares the speaker's connection to the topic, it states the presentation's thesis, and it previews its main points. The conclusion, which are the final words of your speech, is almost as important. It does three critical things. It indicates your presentation is ending, it reviews your main points, and it emphasizes what you want your audience to take away from the presentation. The reason the intro and the conclusion are so important is because of three psychological effects. The first one is called the framing effect. Introductions and conclusions frame your audience's perceptions of the information and show them what to focus on. Then we have the primacy effect, in which we tend to remember and place importance on our first impressions of a speech. And the recency effect, which is our tendency to remember and place importance on our last impression of a speech. This doesn't mean that what happens in the middle isn't important. Of course it is. But the impressions that we take away from the speech tends to be stronger in the beginning and the ending. It's just the way our brains work. So it might be a good idea to make sure your introduction and conclusion meet all of their functions and are effective, interesting, and memorable. Let's look at putting together an introduction. The first step is to get your audience's attention. You really need to determine what will catch their attention and connect it to your topic quickly. In fact, you only have about 15 or 20 seconds to accomplish this. Some speech teachers call this part of the introduction the hook. Like a hook on a fishing line, it needs to be catchy and interesting and pull them in to want to hear what you have to say. Here are a few common strategies. Surprising facts or statistics like this one. Did you know that the average drunk driver drives while intoxicated more than 80 times before their first arrest? Or stories? How about this one? In 1781, Deborah Gannett disguised herself as a man and enlisted to fight in the Revolutionary War. There's obviously more to that story. Or quotations. The great civil rights leader W.E.B. Du Bois once wrote, The cost of liberty is less than the price of repression. Or even rhetorical questions or hypothetical situations like this. When you turn on the kitchen faucet, water comes out. That's just something we take for granted. But have you ever wondered where that water comes from and how it got to your tap? Next, you have the credibility step. Let your audience know why they should listen to your unique perspective. Now, you don't have to be an expert in the topic, although you should certainly know something about it, and you should have done enough research to speak about it. The following are a few ways to share your commitment to your topic with your audience. You might have some kind of experience about it. Maybe you were hit by a drunk driver and your car was totaled, so you have an obvious interest in it. Tell that to us. Or you might actually have some expertise on the topic. Maybe you're a proud member of the National Guard and know what it is to be a woman who serves her country. Explain your expertise to us. And you might have a real passion for the topic. Maybe you're excited about your career goal to be a city planner and you learned about urban water systems in a city management workshop last year and you want to share that and tell us how cool that was. Then you need to tell us your thesis, clearly communicate it to us. Let it flow naturally out of your personal connection to the topic, investing it with the emotional power of your standpoint to grip your audience. For example, in the speech about women serving their country, you can state the thesis, historically, women have overcome many barriers to be able to serve in the military. And although we have made many strides, we still have many more to go. The final step in your introduction is the preview. 
and that provides the audience a clear statement of what the main points of the presentation will be in order. You're going to provide the audience a roadmap of your two to five main points. And the way you present your preview is going to depend on your speaking situation and the structure of your speech. For the women in the military speech, it's very likely because it's a historical informative speech to be in chronological order. So it's probably going to be something like this. So today I'll inform you of the different roles that women served in the military in our past, how women's military roles changed from the 1990s to the present, and finally we'll look at how far we still have to go. Okay, once you've got the introduction planned out, now you can tackle the conclusion. The first thing you need to do is cue the ending. You definitely need to let the audience know you're at the conclusion. You can switch to past tense and say, today I've shown you, or you can say in conclusion or in closing, or I'd like to close by and then moving on to your review. Then you need to review or summarize your main points. Basically, sum up what you told us in the body of the speech. It's kind of like the preview, only it's in the conclusion. And finally, provide a takeaway. Revisit your thesis. End with a good closing statement called a takeaway. It's what you want the audience to take away with them from your speech. If you recall the recency effect, they're more likely to remember the most recent thing you said, which in the speech is the last thing you say. So make it something interesting and memorable. Okay, so I put together a sample introduction and conclusion for a speech about our urban water system here in Southern Nevada, so you can see what one would look like with all the parts put together. So here's what the introduction might look like. The attention step could be something like, when you turn on the kitchen faucet, water comes out. That's something you just take for granted. But have you ever wondered where that water came from? Then you move into your credibility step. I admit that I used to be ignorant of the journey our water takes to get to our houses, but that all changed when I went to a week-long workshop with the Southern Nevada Water Authority as part of my degree program in civil engineering. It was so fascinating to go behind the scenes and see exactly what the Water Authority does. So this person talks about their credibility on this topic. Then they move to the thesis. The water that flows into your house comes from several sources, including from the Colorado River and local groundwater, and it's treated to make sure it's safe before it's sent through into our homes. Then they move to the preview. So today I'll inform you about those sources of our water the different treatment steps it goes through, and the delivery system that brings it to our taps. You can tell that there are going to be three main points here. The sources of our water, where the water comes from, the different treatment steps it goes through, and the delivery system that brings it to our taps. So that's three main points. So then they can go into the body of speech and go into detail on each of those three main points. Once they've done that, then they'll move to the conclusion. They're going to cue the ending. Obviously, right here, it's very simple. So, in conclusion, then they're going to summarize the main points. Today, I've told you about our water delivery system here in Southern Nevada. You learned about the sources of our water, how it's treated, and how it's sent out to our homes. So, basically, just reiterated the preview. Then, they're going to provide a takeaway. So, this is the last thing they say. I hope your new understanding of this process has helped you to not take this resource for granted. This is a desert after all. So the next time you turn on your faucet, remember the words of American anthropologist Lauren Isley. If there is magic on this planet, it is contained in water. Thank you. That's a really nice ending. He talks about how important water is and he has a really nice nice quote to end it. And it's always good to end your speech with the words, thank you. So that way the audience knows you're really, really done. Okay. I hope you can see how nicely that flowed. Okay. At this point, you're ready to put together your preparation outline and speaking notes. Outlining is critical to creating a good speech because it shows you the structure. So you can make sure you've got all the components and they're where they need to be. A speech isn't stream of consciousness. It's very structured. Everything has a place. 
That's why we don't write it manuscript style, in case you wondered. An outline is a structured summary of the key elements of your presentation. Outlining can help you develop and revise the organization of your speech to make it clear as possible and flow smoothly from the beginning to the end. Using an outline can also make practicing and delivering your presentation much smoother and easier. Your preparation outline is a detailed, full sentence outline containing every substantive idea, argument, concept, and fact in your presentation. Preparation outlines help you organize your presentation and ensure that your organization is sound. If your speaking situation requires a specific format, always follow the guidelines you've been given. I always try to use the formatting guide given in whatever textbook I'm using, so do your best to follow it. Here's an example of an outline that's formatted correctly. There's a copy of this outline as a Word document underneath this video on the Canvas page, so you can open it, print it out if you wish. You can even use it as a template for your own outline if you want. Let's take a closer look at it here so you can see how it's put together. As you can see, the topic, specific purpose, and thesis statement are always at the top of the page followed by the organizational pattern, which in this case is chronological. All parts of your outline need to be labeled. So you label the introduction, then all the different parts of the introduction, label the transitions, that's the sentences you use to get from one part of the speech to another, label the body of the speech. When you get to your main points, you need to use the typical outlining organization system that goes from general to specific. With main points, the most general information being designated by Roman numerals, then subpoints designated as capital letters, then the most specific information or examples designated as regular numbers. In the introduction, the attention material, the credibility statement, the thesis statement, and the preview are all written out word for word. I have a transition statement into the body of the speech. The first main point is Roman numeral one, and under that I've got four subpoints A, B, C, and D, and under each one of those I have some material that would be called sub-subpoints, but that's evidence or specific information, and those are designated with regular numbers. Then I have another transition to main point number two. Under that, I've got five subpoints, but the only one where I break it down into sub-subpoints is under the first subpoint, because I'm talking about the different kinds of software that you're going to need. Then I have a transition to the third main point, which is about recording. And uh, this goes over the next page. So let's go there. So then I would have five subpoints for that third main point. Some of them are broken down into sub sub points and some are not. Then I have a transition into the fourth main point, which is broken down into three sub points. Then I label the conclusion and label each part of the conclusion, cueing the ending, reviewing the main points, and the takeaway. Then I have a works cited page with the different sources in MLA format. So that's how you format your preparation outline. Once you have your preparation outline, you're going to use that to prepare your speaking outline. Now the preparation outline is used to prepare the speech. The speaking outline or speaking notes, they could be called either. That's what you actually use to deliver the speech. A speaking outline is a brief keyword outline for delivering your presentation. Your preparation outline is the starting point for your speaking outline. And in your speaking outline, you're going to include prompts for all the main points of your outline, plus any specific numbers, direct quotations, or citations that you need to state precisely. Everything else is brief keywords. You're basically editing down your preparation outline to include just what is necessary. 
So let's see what speaking notes for that preparation outline might look like. So generally speaking, you use one note card for your introduction, one note card for each main point, and one note card for your conclusion. In that speech, I would have six note cards, but I don't have them all on here. I've got the first four. Also, I'd get the big note cards, the big four by six, not the little three by fives. They're really too small, and you may not be able to see the words that you put on them. Now, the whole point of editing your speech down is so that you don't read it. This isn't a reading class. It's a speech class we already know you can read. You'll notice that the topic, specific purpose, and thesis statement aren't on here because you don't need them. And you'll also notice that if you just read the words straight off these cards, um, they wouldn't make any sense. But you would have chosen the words that would help you remember the entire idea that you're trying to get across to the audience. And you don't need all the words to do that. Another thing you'll notice is that there are some highlighted words on these cards. The yellow ones are slide one, slide two, slide three, etc. Those are about the visual aids. They remind the speaker to advance the PowerPoint slide to the next one to match what they're talking about. And the blue highlight, that reminds them to say those transitions because a lot of times people forget to say them. But it also keeps them on track to make sure they're in the right place. You can also highlight quotations or statistics or anything that you need to specifically remember. Now, of course, I'll put this entire document under the video on the Canvas page as well. Then once you've got your speaking notes created, you need to start practicing your speech with it. The more you practice, of course, the less detailed notes you're going to need. You practice with your speaking outline, but you have your preparation outline, the one with all the words on it, nearby as a reference. So when you forget what you meant by what you wrote down on your card, you can check with it to make sure what you meant to say. And then you just keep going back and forth until you don't need that preparation outline anymore and you can easily deliver your presentation from just your speaking notes. And this chart on the right hand side basically outlines the steps of going from the first part of putting a speech together all the way to practicing and revising your speaking outline. Good organization and outlining are essential for shaping your audience's understanding and recollection of your speech. All these documents here will be available underneath this video on the Canvas page. This is the end of the lecture on chapters 15, 6, 8, and 9.